Hey folks, welcome back to Sub2 Investor. My name is Hans and in this episode, I'll be breaking down my ninth subject to deal for you. Now, in my first two years of creative finance investing, I was able to scale more than 30 properties that cash flow and that enabled me to attain some degree of financial independence and allowed me to go full time to pursue real estate as my full time endeavor so that I could live my dream life. Now, I hope that this channel helps you do the same thing. In this episode, you're going to see a really interesting deal that we were able to put together. And you're going to want to stick around to the end because I'm going to show you how I hold this property as a rental to this day without being the landlord who's managing and operating on this property, but I'm going to show you how we structured it so that you can do the same thing and hold on to some of these assets as they appreciate and depreciate on your tax return. Now, if you didn't know already, this is part of my Real Sub 2 Deal Breakdown playlist. If you haven't checked out this playlist, it's chock full of subject to deals I've closed. This is number nine, but I've already walked through one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, my first eight deals in detail showing you how I got the property, how we structured it, you know, the paperwork, all that good stuff, and then the exit strategy on these deals. So check out that playlist if you haven't already. Now, this deal came from guess where? Drum roll, please. The expired low equity list. One of my favorite lists for obtaining subject to deals. People ask me all the time, how do I find deals? I don't have any deals. There aren't any deals out there. Simple answer to that question. Go on to PropStream, pull a list of failed listings with loaned values greater than 80% and market to those, send them postcards and you will find subject to deals in that list. That's how we got this property. It was from an expired listing. I sent a postcard out to a batch of recently expired listings filtered for low equity. So, you know, I use PropStream's filter to estimate the equity amount. And usually I cut it off at 70% loan to value. It needs to be higher than that if you're going to receive a postcard from me. This individual got my postcard, looked at it, called my phone number. I picked up. We had a conversation. And that conversation basically went something like this. Hey, I got a property I need to sell. It's in the St. Louis area. It's currently rented. However, I owe too much and I can't sell it on the market. In fact, I tried to list it with a realtor and it failed to sell. What can you do for me? I said, well, yeah, you know, taking a look at this, learning a little bit about your property and the loan you got on it. Seems like I'm not going to be able to purchase it cash. And so Really, the only option that I can think of would be to buy the property still, leave the loan in place in your name. I take over payments on that loan and you just walk away from the property. Property owner said, sounds good to me. As long as I get a little cash in my pocket, I'm good with that. I'm going to show you the numbers on this deal. Okay, We bought this property for a grand total of $121,000. Now, the way that I arrived to this price and I get a lot of questions about how do I fill out a subject to purchase agreement? And it's very simple. Let me break it down for you. You're going to want to know what the loan amount is, whatever loans or liens you're taking subject to. In this case, there was a loan, a first mortgage in the amount of $116,000. That was the first number we needed to know. The second number we needed to know was how much cash is required bring the seller at closing. And what we negotiated was $5,000. So that's the second number that we need to know. Now, when we add those two numbers up, because there were no other liens and the seller was not carrying back any equity, we only had these two numbers. We add them together and we get our purchase price. So he sold the property for $121,000. That's the number reflected on the settlement statements. One of the great things about this deal is the interest rate. The interest rate on this loan that we took sub to was 2.875%. Now we all know that money is no longer available to borrow at interest rates that are this low, which is why subject to, just one reason why subject to is so amazing. You're never gonna be able to borrow in today's economy in 2024, $121,000 at under 3% interest. The only way you can really do that is with seller financing, a free and clear property. 
which I've done before too. 0% seller financing. That's the only thing that can really beat this. But again, we're in the realm of creative finance and that's why you're watching this video. So we are at a 2.85% interest rate. The crazy thing about this property besides this interest rate is that it's 40 year amortization. Have you ever seen a loan that was amortized over 40 years? If you ever did a loan modification during the years of COVID, then maybe you got a 40 year amortization. This was one creative way that banks were able to lower borrowers' monthly payments without changing the principal balance. They simply re-amortized the loan instead of 30 years. Now it's 40 years, and that basically lowers the monthly payment amount. And so it's always a good idea if you're going to do subject to deal to get on the phone with the lender and confirm all of the terms of the loan that you are taking subject to. In this case, the monthly payment was $566. So that is principal, interest, taxes, and insurance. Now, these are all of the loan assumptions on the loan that we took subject to. So what did we decide to do with this property? Well, we didn't have much of a choice because there was already a tenant in the property. They had just signed a lease with the seller. They were on now the second month of the lease. And so we were stuck with the tenant for another 11 months. So we had to rent the property out. So the rents that we were receiving were $1,200 a month, $1,200 a month in rents, which made for actually good cash flow, $634 during this lease period. That's pretty dang good cash flow. However, we were actually $6,000 out of pocket on this deal. Our front end expenses totaled $6,000. And the way I'm getting the $6,000 is by simply adding our cash that we gave to the seller at closing, plus our closing costs, which I forgot to put down here. Our closing costs were approximately $1,000. So we had a front end expense of six grand in the deal. We self-funded this deal. So we didn't have a private money lender involved in this particular deal. We were renting it out at 1200 a month. Our cash flow was 634 a month. Our tenant ended up stopped paying near the end of their lease. So we had to file an eviction and we eventually ended up just doing cash for keys. During their time being in the property, we made a total cash flow of $5,706. Now what's cool about that number is that we basically made all of our upfront capital expenses back just by the cash flow in this deal within, you know, a nine to 11 month period, somewhere around there. Now, once the tenant vacated the property, there was a few repairs we needed to do about $500 of a make ready rehab, you know, very minimal, which we were extraordinarily thankful for. And we ended up doing a lease and option with another tenant on this deal. This was phase one of our exit strategy on this deal. Phase two was lease and option. So when we came here and we did a lease and option, we decided to do a lease and option because this property was in like a C-class type neighborhood. If you classify neighborhoods by either A-class, you know, highly appreciating great schools, B-class, you know, decent schools, some rentals, some owner occupants, C-class, which is mostly rentals, however, decent type areas, and then D-class, which is, you know, all rentals, but this is more like the ghetto and tenants tend to destroy properties or not pay. You have a lot more evictions. This property was like in a C-class area. It's a lot more difficult to find a seller finance buyer in a C-class neighborhood. It's not impossible. It's certainly possible. But even if I did find somebody, the chances that they would have a large down payment at this price point in this kind of neighborhood is pretty small. And so I wanted to do a lease and option because they could get in with less money down and I could really try them out as a potential buyer for at least 12 months to see how they take care of the property and if they pay on time. I mean, that's really the big one if they pay on time. So we did a lease and option with an individual. They ended up bringing an option fee 
in the amount of $2,500 up front, and they were going to bring an additional $2,500 after about six months. $2,500 option fee, which gives them the option, the exclusive right to buy this property at a set price. I believe the set price was like $130,000. So the option price was $130,000, meaning they could actually come in with their own financing at any time and buy the property at $130,000. However, we told the individual we'd be willing to finance this property for them on a contract for deed if they were able to pay the rents on time, keep the other terms of the lease for at least 12 months, then we would consider doing a contract for deed as long as they could still qualify at that point we'd be good with it. And so that's what we did. And we ended up getting not quite as high as $1,200 a month, but a $1,100 a month because pigs get fed, but hogs get slaughtered. This was not the best area. We didn't like having a vacant house in this area. We just wanted to put somebody in there and move on with the next deal. And so we did $1,100, which meant that our cash flow on this part of the deal was approximately $534 a month in cash flow. So that's still a very solid cash flow on this subject to deal, which then we did a lease and option on. $534 a month, guys. What could you do with that amount of cash flow? How many of these deals would you want to have until you felt like you could quit your day job and do real estate investing full time? That's going to depend on you and your lifestyle and your situation. But this is just great cash flow. And on a lease and option, they are homeowners in training, to borrow the phrase from my friend Bill Walston, who also does many lease options. We tell the tenants that they are going to be the ones doing the repairs, the maintenance, and the upkeep of the property. So we expect to never really hear from you. Now, this deal would have worked out really well had this tenant buyer really liked this property and just wanted to live here for a long time. However, he just didn't really like this property. And I think that was somewhat an error of our judgment, really not making sure that they were a great fit. So we had another property, which we had also bought subject to because that's how I buy most of my properties. We decided to show that property to him and see if he was interested. And he ended up liking that house more. So we moved that individual over to that house. And then we had a vacant property once again. And this tenant was only in the property for seven months at this time. But in that seven months, we netted a total of $4,280 in net cash flow from his occupancy of this property. So we had that. We had the option fee during the rental period. We had made this amount. Our front end expenses were only $6,000. So by this time, we are already made whole. We have already made a net profit on this deal. We were only six in it. We basically made it back. And then on the option fee, we were a little bit positive. And then with the cash flow, we were even more positive. And what's great is that we held this property as a technically a rental. So we're able to depreciate property on our tax returns, which is a great thing. Now, finally, getting to the third phase of this deal. And I hope that you stuck with me to this point because I'm going to reveal to you how I am still renting this property out and cash flowing it and not having any of the responsibilities of the landlord in this deal. So when this tenant finally moved out, we were faced with a vacant property in a C-class neighborhood yet once again, and we needed to fill the vacancy. And I thought, well, I just don't really like the way this is going. I don't know if it's gonna be really a great long-term house for anybody, any kind of family who's gonna wanna be here long-term. Street is just kind of okay, and it really is a rental type area. What if I just, you know, sell this whole deal? I, I assign the subject to loan and the property to somebody else. You know, maybe I make $15,000 on it or something. But then I'd be done, you know, making money on the property if I did that, right? It'd be like if I just wholesale the subject to contract to somebody, you know, I make my my fee and but then that's all the money that I make, you know? I didn't really sit well with me, especially with a loan that was at 2.875 interest rate, such a low monthly payment. There's got to be a way to make more money on this deal, yet not have to really be the landlord on this deal. And so my thought was, you know, I have a friend who 
is a professional landlord who owns a lot of properties as rentals, and they really like being a landlord and they like getting the property ready, rehabbing it, and managing tenants themselves. And they're really great at it. And I really trust their work at it. And they've been doing it for a while. Oh, and I also have done a deal with them before in the past. It was a wholesale deal that we uh, sold to them, but but they were great in the transaction and everybody worked well together. And I know this person individually. It just seemed like such a natural thing to call this individual and see if they would be interested in joint venturing, not just joint venturing, but actually being an equity partner on this deal. Would you like to own this property with me? You know, you take all of the tenant management, all of the rehab, all the bookkeeping, and I'm just going to let you in on this deal. And the agreement that we came to was this. Essentially, you'll get 50%. I'll take 50%. I do want a little bit of a buy-in, like $5,000 to buy into the deal, but then that's it. You are now a 50% owner However, management of tenants is on you, any repairs, you know, is on you, and you'll do the bookkeeping and just send me a report at the end of the year. And that's the deal that we struck. Now, it's a great deal for this landlord because now they're going to be able to cash flow another property, add another property to their portfolio. It's kind of just like rinse and repeat for them, so kind of no big deal. But then for me, I will get to reap the benefits of still holding an asset that I can appreciate on my tax return and that will appreciate in time, but I don't have to manage the property at all. And I also don't need to hire a property manager because my property manager has skin in the game. They are 50% owner of the deal. How did we structure this? I know that people are going to ask, how did you structure that, what you just said? Here's how I did it. We buy our property in trusts. We always buy our sub two deals in trust because if you don't do that, you're just asking for a problem. Okay. If you don't know how to close a sub two deal in a trust, you really need to check out my website and my paperwork packet for closing sub two deals. I have my trust templates in there and all of the other disclosures that you need to have. But we always close our sub two deals in trust for multiple reasons. The main one is anonymity. It's an anonymity shield from the lender so that they can't see who actually owns the property. But also it makes it extraordinarily easy to joint venture with other partners and investors on deals. Because we own this property in a trust, we didn't have to like go to a title company and close, although we could have done that essentially. We gave 50% of our beneficial ownership in the trust to the landlord. And we got notarized essentially a transfer of beneficial interest. And now they are 50% owner of the trust that holds title to this real estate. Now I retain my 50% and the landlord will do the management, the repairs, and the bookkeeping. I, I basically, I got the deal and I funded the deal with my creative finance, right? So I found the property, I found the seller, I found the loan to fund the deal. Essentially, it was the seller's loan and I got the deal. That was my contribution. And now the landlord's contribution was is to manage to do the repairs and to do the bookkeeping plus a $5,000 buy-in, which we thought was reasonable. That's what we did. Now, the crazy thing is that This landlord is pretty savvy and they think that we can get, if we do section eight, $1,500 a month in rents because this property, it's actually, it's a bed bath count where you actually might be able to get $1,500 a month and we haven't gotten it yet, but it's coming within a few months. We'll know for sure, but I think we're going to be able to get $1,500 a month in rents. So if we get this professional landlord in here who knows what they're doing, they can get us a tremendous rental amount using Section 8. And if our monthly payment is $566 a month, well, then our net cash flow is going to be $934 a month. Now, there's no management fee. There are going to probably be some repairs. So let's just say that we take out $200 a month for repairs from that $934 a month. So if we subtract 200, now we're at $734 a 
dollars a month, which you know might be a realistic expectation. And that is the the remainder, which we divide 50-50. So seven thirty four divided by two is three hundred and sixty seven dollars a month. So that's three hundred and sixty seven dollars a month for me and my net cash flow when this deal is all said and done. Plus, you know, I was actually somewhat cash positive on this deal. I got the five grand plus the forty two hundred plus twenty five hundred plus the five seventy. We'll call that about seventeen thousand dollars just totaling that number, that number, that number, that number, minus the six. So we're at about eleven thousand dollar front end profit, you know, which is pretty good for just a rental property where I'm only 50% owner of that property, right? So this would be phenomenal if these numbers work out this way. We'll see what we actually end up getting in rents. But either way, this is going to be a asset on the books, like I said, which is going to be good for tax purposes. And we are going to be able to raise those rents with our landlord putting a little bit more into the property to make it really nice you know, this deal did require quite a bit of work. I'm not going to lie. It took some time, a little bit of a headache and some creativity to find really the ultimate solution in my mind for the disposition strategy on this deal. Now, had I thought about this exit strategy from the get-go, I probably just would have done this. In fact, I really hope that this particular structure, this exit strategy, right, where I bought it subject to in a trust, then I cut a landlord in as an equity partner. If this works out really well, well then now I can go buy properties in C-class areas where I'm probably not going to sell it on a contract for deed or a wrap note. However, I can still hold it as a rental, but I'm not going to manage it. My business partner might be willing to do more deals like this. So I hope that this breakdown opened your mind, gave you some ideas about what's possible with subject to investing. If you are just wholesaling these deals, well then wholesale them either to me or take them down yourself because I'll be able to take the deal and probably work a creative solution where it's just going to work for me. But it's better if you do it yourself so that you can start acquiring cash flowing assets. Assets that actually put money in your bank account every single month. This isn't that hard to do. All this required was a lot of creativity, some patience, and also a network of investors. People know what I do. They know I like to buy creative. And so over time, they begin to build trust in you and eventually might be willing to do a deal like this with you. So if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up, like it, subscribe, and leave me a comment. I really want to know what you think about this particular deal. Did I absolutely crush this one or was there room for improvement? What would you have done with a deal like this? All right, guys, until next time, stay creative. Peace.